Welcome back to another episode of The Debrief, the last debrief before the 2023 World Championships. Of course, we are breaking down Brianson 2023. I'm Tyler Norton. Joining me as always is John Bergman, the author of the uh, of High Drama, The Rise, Fall, and Rebirth of American Competition Climbing, and of course, covering competitive climbing for Climbing Magazine and Climbing Business Journal. And a regular guest, somebody we get once or twice every single year, is of course, Eddie Falk. Uh, you probably already follow him on Instagram. He used to be one of the official photographers for the IFSC uh, through the pre-Olympic period. And of course, he is a competition and scene watcher and pundit at this point. Always has interesting opinions and of course, knows so many of uh, of today that uh, of today's athletes very well so great to have him on the show uh you all know the format we're going to do the headlines from this comp the winners and the losers and because we're going into the world championships we might we might uh, stray a little bit and talk about the season overall but we always start with our special guest so eddie welcome aboard and uh what's it going to be what's the big takeaway from this weekend uh to begin with i feel like you've undersold me I'm also the author of a forthcoming book. It just, it's been somewhat delayed. I've, I've been uh, saying that for two reason, years, man. If it doesn't come out, I can't keep shilling your book if it doesn't get released, dude. Come on. <laughs> well, part of the reason is now that, as rumors would have it, I am going back to Europe um, in September. And I got really frustrated by getting some of the quotes from athletes because some athletes now, I guess their media goes through um, managers and so where I used to talk to people, now you're not talking to them. And so I was like, screw it. Last chance saloon for them to get their words in the book is when I see them in Europe. So I sort of right. shelved it with, okay, I'm going to be in Europe for a month. Um, and that's where I break down my punditry because I also then end up adding national coach to my um, list mm. of accolades. <laughs> you wouldn't be the first Which... national coach to do both at the same time. So, you know. Oh, there's actually very stringent rules when you sign up to be national coach saying you cannot take photos, um, which has sure. obviously been very well respected previously. <laughs> so, nobody but, else nobody else that's released a book has ever done both of those at the same time, so it's fine. Don't worry about it. Oh, it's absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. So, um, and hopefully one day we get Luca's book and that'll be the Holy Trinity. There you go. So, That'd be something yeah. else, yeah. Um, but my biggest headline of Brian Son actually does tie into the Slovenians. Um, and that is, of course, that dreams do come true. And it is that Vita Lukin, after years on the circuit, even though she's still young, you know, she's someone that's been around for a better part of eight years now on the circuit, finally secures her first World Cup victory. And she's the first female Slovenian, not called Jan Gambret, to win since the dinosaurs roamed the earth or at least since Mina Markovic was competing <laughs> I don't know I don't know if that's a, if that's a, a high five to Vita or a huge slight to Mina but it's all good whatever it's all good um yeah you so Vita was one of those young climbers that was coming up uh, kind of in the middle of your career and you got to see the first I would say probably half of her career at this point um I think that's a uh, that's a fascinating take because you're absolutely right it is a dream come true um and there, there must be some kind of reckoning you have when you uh, emerge in an era that is dominated by a teammate of yours. You kind of understand your odds. You understand that this challenge is maybe greater for me than other people. And, uh, and, and so I think that that has to be something where you, you certainly must savor the wins that you, that you are able to secure, right? Um, but yeah, tell us a bit about Vita. Like I know you've, you've gotten to know a lot of these athletes and I, I, a lot of people were very surprised to, to hear her voice for the first time actually in that interview, which was such a, an interesting thing to, to think for somebody that's been around for a while. But what, uh, what's your insight into Vita as a person or as a climber? I, I actually laugh so much at people's reaction to Vita's voice because, of course, I've known Vita since she was 14, I guess. Sure, yeah. And so, to me, there was no surprise that's what Vita sounds like. But, of course, for most people, they have never heard her. Um, but she's one of those climbers that a lot of people say she's one of their favorites to climbers to watch, very much like Astasia because she's a grit and determination style climber. So as opposed to the giant Kim finesse and grace style climber, um, or the Yanya Gambret alien style climber of how did she even do that? 
then you have like the grit and determination style climber and there's always been a place for them for the fighters for the ones that you can tell are pushing themselves you know right to the nth degree to get that last little bit and I think that's always made Vita a bit of a crowd favorite because the fighters stick in your mind more than say some of the other climbers but of course you know going back to what we're discussing can you imagine growing up being one of the best climbers in the world being a youth olympian being you know one of the best juniors ever and every time you go to training there's someone better than you and for a lot of time most countries you you have sort of like the cream rises to the top but in Slovenia's case there's so many fantastically talented young climbers and then there's this massive gap to the most successful climber ever um and, and you know it's probably similar in a way to what it was like for the likes of Sol Sa when they're growing up in the era of uh Jai and Kim or what it's like for Futaba Ito when she grew up in the shadow of Akio Noguchi and you know the fact that Futaba's fame is based on the fact that once she bet Akio really tells you something about how much importance there is in that so even though this is a comp where Yanya wasn't there to see Vita take that win was you know that because how many world cup climbers are there in a given year how many are there over a decade and how many of them ever actually win a world cup no, absolutely. Um, let's break down the the women's podium since we're talking about it. Of course, Vita Lukin gets the high point of 46 uh, on this. Cl- I've got a scoreboard. I should just bring that up if I'm talking about this. Vita Lukin uh, uh, gets gold medal, getting a high point of 46, notably after qualifying, I think, at like 13th place or something like that. So a strong come up across the course of the competition. In second place, also winning her or also earning her second uh, uh, IFSC uh, senior medal is Aliska Adam. Moska from uh, Czechia with a 44 plus and in third place on count back Menohili from France giving the French something to get extra loud about out in the crowd also scoring a 44 plus um, I'll, I'll, I'll let us break into the uh, into the uh, podium chat and talking about the other climbers but the one point I want to bring up just to kind of set a bit of a stage for Briançon and competitions held at this time of year is both Vita and Aliska both won their second IFSC medals at this competition. And if we all remember, their first medals were also won at Briançon, both in 2019, in the event right before the World Championships to qualify for the 2020 Olympics when the field was heavily diminished. Is there is there, uh, is there less value to a Briançon gold medal, guys, that Aliska won uh, four years ago that Vita Lukin won today? John, I don't know if that's a question you want to field right away. How do you feel about that? Oh, yeah, that's kind of that's kind of the big question, isn't it? I I mean, I uh, I don't know to be honest. And I guess it's I don't know if you can have a definitive answer for that. I I think when I hear Eddie's headline, I think uh, meaning regarding Vita's win, I think multiple things can be true at the same time. So on the one hand, everything that Eddie said I agree with. This was a, a great win for Vita Lukin. We didn't even mention the fact that I think, Eddie, you mentioned this on her Instagram, that she had a, a big knee injury, right, that she was she had come back from. Am I remembering that correctly? So there's that added story to this, the, the comeback, and she gets this win. It's a great feel-good story. Additionally, I think it kind of maybe pushes Vita into that, top slot of like you said Eddie anybody on the Slovenian team any woman that's not named Yanya Garnbrett because I know as this season has gone on something I have wondered is who is the second second best woman on the Slovenian team and there are a number of names that have been orbiting around uh, certainly Vita's been orbiting around there you also have Mia Krample you have Luka uh, Luchka Rakovic I think you have also Katja Debevec who had a great preseason i think she won at the what was it the quiff or something like that i think she had a one of those studio block yeah studio block uh i think mia probably has better results for this season on paper but if you just look at 
how awesome Vita fought going from being kind of mid-level qualies to the gold medal here in Brienne Son. I think, yeah, you'd probably say maybe Vita is the second behind Yanya. So all of that is true. Everything that I just said there, everything Ed, Eddie said is true. But I think it also can be true that the main reason, not the only reason, because Vita still had to fight, we have to acknowledge that, but I, the main reason why Vita won is because this women's field was not just diminished. It was decimated. <laughs> it, I mean, I, I, and I, and I quite literally, there was an entire finals field missing. And I say quite literally, because what I did is I went back and looked at the finals field from Innsbruck, the lead portion of Innsbruck from this same season, Yanya Garnbrett, not in Briansson. Jesse Pills, not in Briansson. I Mori, not in Briansson. Brooke Rabatou, not in Briansson. Mia Crample, not in Briansson. Natalia Grossman, not in Briansson. And Helene Janico, not in Briansson. The only finalist from Innsbruck that was at Briansson it was Che Yun So. And that's to say nothing of other people that were absent, like uh, no Orion Bertone, no Miho, I don't think was there. So going back to your question that you posed, Tyler, I. I think you just have to give Vita's win some context. Was it a was it a good win? Absolutely. But I also think we should be honest with ourselves and honest with the people listening and not act like this was some mega statement from Vita or some like breakthrough performance from her because I I don't I don't think it it was. But that doesn't that shouldn't diminish it from from what she did. That's my take on it. So I'm going to come in here and say she beat the last World Cup winner and she beat the reigning world champion. And the reason, they're not in the, it, yeah. the reason they're not in the narrative is they didn't even make finals. That's true, too. So, but okay, may, may I also suggest counters? I, can I suggest counters yeah. to your argument? <laughs> well, you know where I'm going already. Jane Kim's win last week, of course, as we described, was had a lot of these same conditions. And, of course, uh, Cheyenne's World Championship gold, if I'm remembering right, Jan Yegarnbrett was also not in attendance at that competition. So, yeah, it just so it all it all counts. It's all fair. All fair game. Yeah, fair enough. Fair enough. Yeah, there was there was so years ago, I was talking to Jackie Goodoff, who obviously is one of uh the greats of the world climbing scene and the competition climbing scene. And he said, the thing with competition is it never tells you who the best climber in the world is. Never has, never will. It tells you who the best climber that shows up on that weekend is. And that's all you can ever take away from a competition. Cause you could sit there and go, you know, would, um, Angie scarf Johnson, win if she was there would, you know, Chris Sharma have been more relevant if he had been there for more time. He, there's always going to be what ifs and oh, what about this person? You can only rate a competition on the depth of field, which br brings us into something I think we need to discuss later because it is a relevant topic. But um, I think once someone has won a World Cup, and there is an exception to this. The only thing is I've never considered Laura Rigora's win valid. It's not a World Cup victory. From the um, European Cup 2020, Brianne Son? Exactly, yeah. exactly. The <laughs> fact that they then even changed the name to Exhibition World Cup to try and, like, diffuse it, mm -hmm. because everyone's like, well, there's only about five countries showed up, and most yeah, of the Yeah, for those that don't remember, that was the one world cup that happened during the peak early years of covid um and uh it had very limited attendance from anywhere outside of europe so uh one of the biggest asterisks in history probably but in general i think when it's down to the athletes whether they're there or not if they choose not to be there then that doesn't take away from the athletes that are there if something happens that athletes can't make it that's a whole nother ball game I agree completely, and that's something that Tyler and I have said for years, probably on some of the episodes that you've been on, Eddie, which is you can't judge a comp by who is not there. You have to judge a comp by who is there. But at the same time, though, we can't sit here and act like Vita winning at Briançon was the same thing as if she had won at a World Cup when Yanya Garnbrett had been there and Brooke Rabatou had been there and like it's I, 
I think I think John exactly what you're saying is like we can there's nothing to take away from this gold medal Vito Lucan has a World Cup gold medal fairly earned and fairly fought and fairly won and it's hers forever but it's when you try to extrapolate and take what happened on Saturday and use that as an argument to push beyond just the events of of this weekend then that's when you run into issues that you start running into issues when you start to declare oh vita is now possibly a favorite she's moving up the rankings um uh she she's one of the you know it's when you start extrapolating and using this gold medal to justify other arguments where it gets a little bit dicey and there is a difference between you know uh uh, uh winning a single gold medal in your career and 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 winning multiple or winning it against this field versus winning against that field. So I, I think it's completely relevant for this weekend and it is an extraordinary achievement. We always talk about the difference in just straight up the number of women that have won World Cups compared to the number of men that have won World Cups. It is way harder as a woman to win World Cups because there is this this just general uh, uh, operating principle in in women's climbing and and as some people suggest in other sports too I'm just like too too much of a nerd to know anything about other sports but there are just it seems uh, the the best women win more events it makes it harder for for other women too so so this is uh, a huge deal just to have won a single World Cup puts you on a on a very special list um so i i think she has everything to be happy about and kind of as she said in her interview after just you know how how good it feels to have a performance that you can be proud of regardless of your placing and then you know 30 minutes later 40 minutes later to receive a medal for that is the icing on the cake um that's the you know i think she's always been fighting just to be able to express herself and and do the best climb possible in finals and have the bonus of a gold medal for it uh is a is a special day for her and who knows it could be the beginning of uh alberto guinness lopez style (laughs) run at the olympics we never know could be could be let, let me say my headline, because this is all exactly in line with what we're talking about here. I think it'll just be a continuation of this discussion. So one of the things I was thinking about was going back to Chamonix a couple weeks ago, a week and a half ago, whatever it was. You, you know, after Jain Kim's win there, we were analyzing it and we were saying, was Jain's win enough to make that comp? kind of special and rise above the fact that there were so many people absent. It, it was in the, we were in the same boat that we are now. I think there were probably more absences here at Briançon, but we were trying to analyze that comp, the Chamonix world cup. And we were kind of like, well, did it, did it kind of supersede all of those absences? And we agreed that Giants win was the thing that allowed it to, that was a historic win and it made it special enough that it's like, we don't care that there are so many absences. So I think you have to do the same kind of analysis here with this Briançon World Cup. And you have to look at Vita winning and Serato winning, which we haven't really talked about too much yet. But you kind of have to say, well, does do either of those allow this one to rise above the fact that there were so many absences? I, I And I think I've kind of made my 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 position known. I, I don't really know, but I'm. I'm kind of thinking probably not, but it's mainly because we didn't really learn anything from this competition. Like, like we didn't gain anything that we didn't already know heading into it. I mean, I ask, how good is Vita Lucan? I don't know because she didn't beat Yanya or Brooke or I Mori or Mia Crample or Natalia Grossman, right? How good is Serato? I, I mean, they're darn good, but like, I don't know. He didn't beat Andre. He didn't beat Alex Magos here at Briançon. I, I think like uh, I, kind of the way I take it is like we didn't, uh, this competition really didn't change our opinions of what we already had. Like, it's not so much that we don't know. Like, we kind of know how good Vita Lukin is. And, and I think you and I, John, would say in this field, yeah, she sounds about a winner, especially if Chayun and Jane Kim don't get to the final round. Absolutely. Like, why not? And same thing for Serato and Raku. Like, look at this field take these people to finals and say, yeah, and uh, I think Serato's absolutely got a fair shot. Look at his results over the last couple months, right? That is a consistent climber uh, getting high finishes. Why can't he do what uh, uh, what Sean Bailey did, what Colin Duffy did? Why can't he win a boulder and a lead given these results in this kind of form? Like, that's uh, it is, uh, it, it, all of it kind of went to plan. This was all something that like was within our realm of expectation, sort of. Yeah, and I guess I don't even know if I said my headline yet, but I think my headline is Briançon provide provided more questions than answers. Mm. And I think 
The kicker, though, is what happens if Vita goes and has a phenomenal world championship performance, you know, may, makes to the Olympics? Maybe she even has a phenomenal Olympic performance. Eddie, you, you know, we mentioned Alberto. L- what if Serato has a fantastic world championship performance, goes to the Olympics, has a fantastic Olympic performance? If any of those scenarios happen, then I think the, the importance and the relevance and maybe the special quality that we were talking about does happen, does appear for this Brianson World Cup because we're looking back at it like, hey, this is like the origin point where we kind of saw Vita and Serato kind of like for the first time really, really shining. It kind of gave, gave us a glimpse of what they were capable of potentially, you know, in the World Championships or in the Olympics. We'll see what happens. But that kind of makes this competition interesting in that you can't really say how important this competition was yet. You can't really say whether or not it had something special because we don't know. Like, let's just, we, let's see what happens in the world championships and see if Serato and Vita go on a you know, phenomenal run. Uh, TBD. It's interesting hearing that. So, couple of takeaways from that and i know i keep referring back to people i've spoken to but it's because i guess we've had these conversations with people over time and you know something i remember killian saying to me years ago was the first world cup victory is the hardest and once you've won a world cup it actually changes your position going into future world cups because you're not trying to get that first victory anymore so even if it was a slightly lower hurdle than it might have otherwise been if all the strong athletes were there, it's still hurdle cleared. And does that then psychologically give those athletes a boost going into the next comps? I'd definitely argue that it does because they go into World Champs or the World Cup overall or Olympic selection as World Cup winners, which gives them a little bit of mana over the girls in the field or the guys in the field that haven't achieved that yet. So even if it's against a weaker field, they have that medal. They have that tick against their name. That's that's the joke that just makes this this scenario unique because I think that that quip that the, the first one is the hardest. It is getting op- like getting through that mental block, right? It, it, getting that achievement and realizing you can be one of those people. That this, of course, has to be by far the easiest, hardest win of anybody's career, where just the entire like the top ten field just like didn't show up. But I, I think that's a relevant point, and and there's nothing to take away that coming out of an injury and and reaching like a new stage in her life, like it's absolutely possible that an athlete like V could have some kind of extraordinary come up and become even more relevant than she has in the past. I think that's completely possible. Um, but uh, yeah, again, I, 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 I don't expect that. I think there's a lot of things in the way, but that is a, that is a great point. And maybe this loosens her up. Maybe it's a confidence boost you need going into the world championships and, uh, and get some of those ranking points that you need. And maybe you end up going into the OQS being like a, a super strong contender and, and you get that second Slovenian spot. I, I think it's fair game. John, like you mentioned before, Mia Krampel and Luchka Rakovic, um, I think Vita is, is at the point where her and Mia are kind of, are kind of both kind of equally relevant at this point. Um, we'll see what happens. It's uh, it's kind of up in the air. That's uh, that's totally fair play. Yeah. Um, my headline has to be Serato and Raku, um, particularly that there's already people on the internet wondering if he's looking Yanya esque and if he might be like the next you know, greatest of all time climber that's ever come out of the sport, which is always a a good, a good sign to turn off the computer and uh, take a walk and think about what you've said. Um, But, you know, he's, he's this, this next guy that's managed to win a Boulder and a lead in the same season. He's doing it in his rookie season, uh, uh, which is an incredible debut. And of course, his climbing is looking remarkably solid, topping all four of the routes. John, like you said, watered down field, 100%. Um, World Championships is probably going to be the most pressure that this kid has ever experienced in his entire competitive career. Um, So I wouldn't let anybody get too excited this is probably his first really big 
you know, uh, not just in terms of pressure, but also in terms of the schedule of this world championships. This is going to be a real big deal, probably the hardest thing he's ever had to deal with. Um, but not taken away from this gold medal. It was awesome. This kid is a star. Uh, what did you guys think of this? What are you making of him? Is this kid a favorite for the world championships at this point? Um, or are we worried that he might be in a bit of a Colin Duffy episode where you've got a hot run and then woo? I regret making that sound effect the end of my sentence. I apologize. Uh, that was very no. confusing. That way, John. <laughs> throw throw to the American. What's what's is this is this the next Colin Duffy crater? Well, I don't know. I, I, I mean, I don't want to compare him to Colin or, or compare him to Yanya for that matter. I think I don't want to compare a rookie to anybody because we have seen and we don't need to sit here and do name you mean names. It, do you mean it's not appropriate to decide if somebody may be a future greatest of all time within the first six months of their World Cup career? Is that what you're well, suggesting? We've seen so many people have good half seasons or maybe even a good full season not maybe it's their rookie year maybe it's when they're whatever 17 18 19 point is we've seen like singular good seasons it's another thing to do it season after season i'm not saying serato can't do it i'm just saying this would be a case of if, if this was like a math problem you'd you'd say wait we don't have enough information here to do this to do this we it's it's way too early to tell there I are also... there are there are climbers who have had the best rookie season in history and you don't know their names when i say you i mean those people making those comments like you don't know the names of the people that have had the best world cup season you have forgotten about them already or you just never understood or you never knew their names right so yeah let's tone it down a little bit sorry john yeah and also yanya kind of spoils us all i i think in a way like that is not that is not the norm at all and you could even say it's a once in a generation thing to have somebody that is that dominant across both disciplines i mean to say to compare somebody to yanya i mean it it, it just it's really in, incomparable you can't really do that uh for, I, for I a lot of different reasons yeah, for a lot just... of different reasons yeah and uh, so, and, and this is all, of course, revolving around a kid who's 16 years old. He's still a kid, right? He should, he should be afforded an opportunity to just kind of be a kid for a bit and not have all this pressure on him. Uh, so I don't know. I would just urge everybody to kind of pump the brakes a little bit. It's, it's certainly really fun watching him. He's got a great style and, and he's a crusher, but, uh, you know, let's kind of check in again maybe after world championships, seeing how that goes. Maybe let's check in after a couple years, see how that goes. You know, um, I'd like, I'd like to have a little more time before we start saying things like Yanya ask. Eddie, do you think the Japanese team knows how to handle a rookie that's this hot? Like, do you oh, think? Of course. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. Oh, look, they, they fire rookies around like darts. They have, hot rookies all the time um and you know it's a bit of an exception that he's done well in boulder as well as lead so early but they've had tassai homa they've had um lots of other talented rookies come through with a hot hand there's a reason why and it's sad for the sport but good for japan but there's a reason why the finals was seven out of eight Japanese. Um, yeah, they are incredibly progressive of how they manage their athletes. But with the whole Serato thing, you got to let people learn to be an adult, have their adult body, see where they are in terms of dreams and aspirations before you can make a call on it. Because, you know, what happens if he gets a girlfriend and develops a taste for pizza. Um, <laughs> what happens if I, that may sound funny, but the mother of the mother of an Olympian who I won't say who messaged me when he got a girlfriend and said, can you please have a word with my son? Cause now he's got a girlfriend and he's not training. All he's doing is eating pizza on the couch. He might say and a nasty habit possibly. Yeah. Three, three, three years later, he was an Olympian, so I'm not saying that was my talking to him in any way, shape, or form. But is that um, how you got your you coaching know. job? You just you just spit that story all the time. 
<laughs> yeah, that that's a hundred percent it. But um, no, that the thing is, you know, where's the Shima now? Mm-hmm. Um, where where are all the next big things? There there is a countless list of next big things, and Enrique has gone further than the vast majority because to get double World Cup victory, yep. you know, is an incredible achievement. Puts them in a very small club. But as John was saying, it's years before you can actually come back and evaluate that data and see what it means. It's not something we can do next week, next month, even next year. Even an Olympic gold medal doesn't say that he'll have a young year late run. You know, so... And and also, just if you look through history, I think, Tyler, you were saying this too, it's 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 kind of rarer even for a man to be dominant compared to the the women's division. I I don't 100%. know why that is, right? But it, you can definitely look at some stats there and there there are in the women's division there's you know the honest store who has a has a run and there's the I mean you can there's a, a, a number of them that we could name. That's the point. And there's Yanya Garnbrett of course. You don't really see that in the men. I mean a little bit maybe like early early 90s uh some of the you know couple of the Francois were doing Dom- dominance for the men looks very different, right? It's, it's, you know, you win a couple gold medals in a season and you manage to do that for a few years kind of thing, right? Compared to the women's model, which is winning half, if not more than that of each year. Of course, Yanya is spoiling us by sweeping seasons and stuff, but yeah, previous female dominance is, you know, you win, you win like three out of six or you win four out of eight or something. And you do that for six, seven years rather than, you know, just three for the men, right? It's uh, it's very different. Yeah, another reason why it just it's it's really a you, it it doesn't it falls flat when you try to compare Serato Cer- and his potential and all of that to anything that that Yanya has done because the the two divisions have played out very differently if you look at the historical stats. Yeah, absolutely. Um, let's uh, let's do let's do like a let's do because I know we want to talk about some stuff like kind of like seasonal kind of like build up to the world championships. So how about we just do kind of like a, a combo winners and losers today? I'll let you guys start where you want to start, and if you got two, we can do two. Um, but uh, I, John, can I throw to you next if you have a, a winner that hasn't been mentioned or a loser, whichever way you'd like to go? Yeah, I've got a couple that I could name, but I don't since I'm going first, I don't want to steal multiple if it, you know maybe some of you chose these but you got to say Hannes Puman for the winner yeah. because he represented so i was thinking okay how many countries there's like a what 193 countries in the united nations so hannes represented 192 <laughs> countries <laughs> it's not exactly fair cuz i think what are there like 100 member federations in the ifsc or something like that so it's less but we're all just kind of joking but yeah i mean Hannes, the only uh, competitor not on Team Japan in the finals. Uh, you gotta, you gotta make something special out of that. You gotta give him some props for that. Uh, I think Matt Groom even said on commentary that Hannes is <laughs> representing the rest of the world. So, uh, and uh, so good for him. It's fun um, to see him in I, the finals too. I'm gonna build on that slightly because where did Hannes spend his whole off-season training? There you go. And I found it quite funny because uh, it, during observation, Matt's like, oh, and Harness won't know any of these guys. And Harness and Tasso, for example, are very close friends. And Harness, I think, was over there for months preseason mm-hmm. in Japan. So it did sort of make me laugh because, you know, I've been friends with Harness a long time. We follow on social media. And I was like, dude, you're always in Japan now. <laughs> have, you, uh, have you talked to him about that haircut? You got any explanation for what that's about? Is that a prank? Is What's going on there? I no, I, I look. I haven't actually spoken to him for a while. I should shoot him a message, but it's a sensational haircut. Harness is just a special, special boy. It's one of those things when you're like, like when you look like a bronze statue. I guess you can pull off any haircut at that point. It's just like well, rubbing, that, that's you the know. thing. You know, he could shave the top and go for full like Fry and Monk tonsa, yeah. and it'd still probably be the best looking guy in the field. One hundred percent. Yeah. <laughs> it's, like, you know, it's, um, it's just Harness in a nutshell, and it always gets me a bit that I think Matt plays down some of these people when they compete because he thinks they're relevant. He's like, oh, so last world final he was in was 2019. It's like, well, yeah, it was, but the world's been kind of interrupted since then. Not everyone's had an equal platform coming back up. 
And if you look at where someone like Harness was, boy, he was on the ascension back then. Like, you know, he's... You can't call him a breakthrough climber because he's having a breakthrough like a glacier. But it's yes. like he's he's on the verge of being one of the top dogs. He's just been sitting on that verge kind of admiring the view for a while. But absolutely wrapped for him at this comp because he... He brings a lot to the sport. Like, God, the kid's got a lovely personality. Like, I've got all the time in the world for him. Yeah, it was almost it was almost one of those cases of where during the the comp, it it almost feel, felt like oh, he just he kind of peaked just a little too early because I think he was in like third place in semi. He was the only he was he was the highest competitor in semis who did not top the route, if I remember, uh, and which is you know he was so he was right up there near the near the leaderboard in semis and then in finals you know he was he was down a little farther he was i think well, he seven. just looked gassed he yeah. just looked gassed in finals he did look like he had run out of run out of steam yeah. but uh, you know i agree with you john absolutely a winner like yeah it was pretty pretty awesome to see and i i'm gonna quickly tack on one of my winners which people might not expect but is aliska under the heading of twice or his luck and so and this is something vita's had a medal before i think you said yeah Tyler? yeah brianne saw yeah. in 2019 yeah and Bronze. then you know for aliska what if you've got a medal it's like meh okay cool if you start to have a cupboard of medals even if they're not all wins Mm-hmm. If you start to have a couple of medals, it and means even you if they're all the Bri- even if they're all Brian Son medals, yeah, <laughs> even if they're all Brian Son, yeah, because even the style varies in Brian Son. You can't just put it down to being easy because it was a far more old school climberly style. Yes. There was far less volumes. It was far more resistance, old school climbing than what you saw in Chamonix or Innsbruck or things like that. Um, so it favored a different climber straight off the bat. You know, I would have loved to have seen a Jakob or someone on that final. He oh, probably yeah. would have had it for, had it for breakfast. Yeah. I so. thought, you know, aside from the, aside from the bottlenecks that we saw, like particularly in the, in the women's semifinal, I thought the roots were uh, like, maybe not the most, certainly not the most exciting roots that we've seen, whether visually or in terms of movement, but very, um, they just felt robust. They felt like the, the word legit, I kind of use for everything, but it they were legitimate roots. They didn't leave me questioning the results aside from, again, those bottlenecks were kind of unfortunate, but they seemed appropriately progressive. They seemed hard in the right ways, even though I think it was Sean McCall that kind of said he felt like they were too soft in the bottom, um, which might be reasonable as well. I was like half asleep well, watching he, semifinals. Well, he probably so. should have climbed further then, shouldn't he? Hey, I can't. As a Canadian, I can't say that. That's not. That's not. Uh, there's there's rules. I, I got to keep my passport. Right? Uh, I, I do wish in that men's final. I can't. Route, I can't shit on our one success of the year, man. Come on. That, that uh, in the men's final route, I really wish they would have made that dino. It was right around the twelfth hold. I really wish they would have made that a little spicier. Everybody just cruised that, and and I, Matt Groom even said on commentary that he he thought you know it wasn't meant to be a, a cruxy dino or something like that. But I'm thinking, why not? You know, make it a cruxy, make it a, make it a big jump. Let's see. You weren't, you weren't satisfied to a a final move dino to the dual, to like the slick side of a dual text hold at the finish. That wasn't enough. I I mean, we only got to see one person do it and they stuck it. Fair, fair point. But, uh, but yeah. No, I'm talking lower though. There was a dino on the route. Yeah. Yeah, Like if they were, if they were going to set the dino, let's, let's add some spice to it. Well, yeah. But I think it should have been a bit bit higher. I mean, 12, 12 holds up, you, you actually don't want them decking. Um, That's a good point. So, That's a good point. You know, it's a, uh, you know, you, you really, if you've got a real stopper dyno, normally they're at 20 to 30 holds up the wall so that they've got five or six clips in to protect themselves at that point. Um, and even so, I've seen some monster falls in Brion Sun over the years. Urban Primovic a few years ago. I think it's still on his Instagram. If you dig really deep, fell from like two thirds of the way up the wall and missed the ground by like, hell yeah, you know, got to be hell like yeah. fifteen centimeters, and it was terrifying to watch because it was a complete out of control because it'd been raining and his foot slipped. 
Right. And so it was complete unexpected for the B layer and completely sideways out of control. And he just stopped like a plank about 15 centimeters off the ground. I'm gonna have to look that one up, man. That one's a that one's a new one for me. Yeah. Uh it's it's yeah. Go way way deep in his Instagram, but it's in there. All right. Even this even this one, there was some some big swings, right? Didn't Hannes? Speaking of Hannes, he hit his head on when he fell. It was uh, not not significantly well, or anything, but he. That's why he he's got that safety haircut. <laughs> so he's always got a helmet on. He's the safest guy in the sport. There you go. Um, I want to I want to shout out a winner real quick. Uh, Ravianto Ramadan, if I'm getting that name right. Let me just make sure. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Best best World Cup result. Like he's only competed in like what five or six of them, but he came onto the scene last year in that Premier uh, uh, Jakarta World Cup at the end of 2022. I think he made semifinals for that again, event, and of course this time around uh, he did the exact same thing, finishing in ninth place, just outside of finals. Um, this locks in actually a pretty good combined score for him um, not guaranteeing anything for the Olympic qualifying series because that is months away before those calculations are done but if you want to talk about the chances of an Indonesian climber getting to the Boulder and lead sta- uh, Olympics uh, the OQS is where it's going to happen probably and him putting up those rankings to make him eligible for I, it's not called the tripartite spot anymore it's the universality pl- I can't remember what it's called but the Indonesian climbers, the two brothers, Ravianto and his and his brother, that I forget the name of off the top of my head, they're they're putting in the work to earn those rankings to still have a, 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 a um, uh, in Indonesian chance of competing not just in speed at the Olympics but also in Boulder and Leeds. So I just wanted to shout out that result because that was uh, that was an exceptional performance from uh, from him. So uh, thumbs up to y'all. Yeah, I've got another quick one. Uh, sorry, just before we move yeah, on. Yeah, keep on them on. Uh, yeah. Is Campbell. I thought Campbell was exemplary in commentary. Uh, when you read the YouTube comments after your average um, World Cup, it's normally a cesspit. But this, you know, most people were just like, dude, the guy's got a career if he ever wants to step in. And it's because he empathizes with the athletes. He knows them. He's been around a long time. He knows the backstories. He, he made the athletes feel more relatable. And he was very balanced in his perspective of watching where the climbers were on the route. He wasn't trying to insert like sort of fake drama and, oh my goodness, their feet are slipped. No, they've just dropped their feet to campus a move because it's more efficient. It was, you know, he brought... As, as he did He because... did have a sense of like, he, he kind of pushed back at that particular moment, which was refreshing. Yeah. Yeah, because the problem with too much excitement, and I don't mean to say any of this to diss Matt as a commentator because everyone has their own style, Mm -hmm. but if you try and make everything exciting, then the actual exciting moments almost blend in. You almost became the boy that cried wolf because every single moment you're like, oh my goodness, oh my goodness, oh my goodness, and then they actually fall off and you're like, oh yeah, that one. Yeah, if you've only got a hair trigger for what counts as something that you need to to ramp up for it, it does make it a little hard to to actually be excited in real life. Yeah, that's fair enough. Yeah. So, but I thought as a balancing act, having Matt as the excitable one and Campbell as the, you know, slightly more stoic but empathetic one, they actually balanced really nice. It was kind of like the Mike Langley and Charlie days. Yeah, of having there was some good conversation. People that people that riffed. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, John. Anything else? Winners, losers. I don't have any other. I was actually going to say uh, Ravianto Ramadan as well. Oh, cool. And uh, the 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 thing that's really cool to me about his result ninth place here almost making it into finals i looked at it you know if you look at his results prior to this Brianson event this season he was 36th in chamonix he was 58th in villar so if you do a little bit of like Brianson math right we're talking about all those people that were absent so if you if you even say okay well if even if all those people that were absent were present at Briançon, I still think this would have been a, a f- wonderful result for yeah. him. <laughs> the Bri- uh, Briançon rule of add ten to whatever your place is. <laughs> yeah, and sure, and even if you even if you add whatever, add five, add ten, it's like he's still way ahead of his mm-hmm. his prior results in Chamonix and Villar. So yeah, really great performance from Ravianto and talking about somebody that does seem to be really like 
peaking at the right time, peaking, you know, meaning as as the Olympic kind of momentum starts to pick up. It seems that he's doing that. So yeah. and and that's just how crazy is that that Indonesia has, you know, somebody that's crushing it in lead. Also, some obviously, you know, people that are crushing it in speed in the men's and women's division. I, all of a sudden, Indonesia is really building some some depth across you know, I mean, it, just to be present is is like a, a, a huge improvement, especially in the Boulder and lead discipline. That's an amazing start. So, yeah, huge deal. Um, yeah, let stuff. me let me spout out a quick combination loser and winner. Uh, rest in peace. Pour one out for Chiansa's uh, 100% progression to finals rate. And also, congratulations, Chiansa. You don't have a giant albatross tied around your neck anymore. Now you can feel free to, to have a bad day and not feel like it's the end of uh, end of your career. So I think a combination of uh, that was a kind of fun run while it lasted, but also now you got the pressure off. So uh, just a bit of a change to the landscape. Now we can't keep repeating that same stat over and over. Thank God. I, I remember when that stat finally went for Yanya, and it's that same feeling. Like, you know, Yanya was devastated at the time mm -hmm. in Chamonix in 2019, was it, when she missed her first final? Um, but at the same time, it was like, yeah, Albatross off her back. Interestingly, in Campbell's commentary, he actually alluded to what may have happened to uh, both the Koreans there. I don't know if you heard when he was talking about viewing, he said, because of the way the stage is constructed, they can't stand back as yeah. far as they often do at World Cups. And he said, so it was very difficult for climbers to see what was above holds. And he, I think he'd been speaking to Molly about it, and she had said, when you were on the route, you, if you took the time to look, you could see there was a hold above it. But when you were viewing from the ground, you couldn't have seen that. And I suspect, you know, being compatriots, that Cheyenne and... Um, Jan read it together and didn't see the blocker and both just went for the middle yeah because they did the exact same thing yes so i think you know horrible for them but shows if you limit their perspective and viewing it actually frozen more variables mm -hmm. um and yeah so that i found quite Quite, you know, it was very insightful of Campbell to share that because it was like, oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. And interesting, too, because both both Jane and Cheyenne actually have pretty well-developed English. Like, I'm always impressed, particularly by Cheyenne. is like, excellent conversation. The fact that they're getting her to do English, you know, promo interviews for, for the World Championships for Bern is, like, very impressive. So so I'm sure they they obviously have the option to preview with others, and maybe they did. But, yeah, I think you're you're right in reading that, the the similarity of their choices at that move with, uh, was looking, uh, I mean, lots of other people fell at that position as well. Obviously that was the ultimate, uh, bottleneck of the competition, if I remember right. Um, but yeah, fair play. I, I think, uh, for Jain, you could also, I mean, if you're going to put Cheyenne on the, on the loser list, you could also put Jain on there as we're, we're kind of dancing around it. I, I think, you know, Tyler, back again to reference our Chamonix debrief, we were saying, okay, this day and age, this stage in, in Jain Kim's career, I don't know if she beats Yanya Garnbrett. I don't know if she beats Brooke Rabatou. It's, it, we were saying, like, her best chance to continue padding her incredible uh, medal count, right, continue adding to her personal trophy case is uh, is you know this these events it, mm -hmm. it's these events where a lot of the field is not there because the world championships are, are looming or you know the olympics are looming or whatever it is like that's where that's where giant can go in and, and pick up some medals maybe pick up some other gold medals so just by that logic i think it's like oh this was like her this was giant kim's big chance to possibly add even another medal to her trophy case or another gold medal. And she just had that low fall. It's like, I don't know how often these opportunities are going to, are going to come for her. Right. We, we, I mean, like once the, um, once the field starts getting like built up again, like presumably like the beginning of next season and whatnot, it'll probably be uh, a pretty stacked field and stuff. And you're kind of like, yeah, I don't know if giant, 
you know, I don't know. So this was kind of like her big chance. So we'll put her on the on the loser list as much as it hurts us to do so because we were <laughs> championing her so much on the previous episode. For, yeah, for anybody misreading the hype around Jane Kim to suggest that she was like, you know, back in the top spot and like a guaranteed finalist for every comp, this like kind of takes a little bit of air out of that argument, which is a good is a good thing. We shouldn't be setting expectations probably that high, although, uh, uh, I mean, who's going to... Who's going to fight with somebody that's been that great for so long? Maybe, uh, you know, that said, this was obviously a disappointing result. Like that, that, that bottleneck was, was heartbreaking for a lot of climbers. And without that, I'm sure she could have uh, gotten quite a bit higher. So. Yeah. At no point did I think anyone there fell off because their no. talent ran out. No. I think no they way. fell out because they misread. So I don't think it diminishes any of the climbers that fell off there. If anything, it'll be a learning opportunity for them. Um, and I'm sure someone of Jane Kim's caliber, I mean, she's got lots of years ahead of her. How old was Jenya's mum when she won her last World Cup? 37, 39? You know, I mean, there's tons of time. So, Natalia? Wait, sorry, what, yeah. what was the question? When was Natalia? How old was no, Jenya Nata- Kazbikova's mum? Wasn't yeah, she? I don't think she was that anywhere close to that old. I thought she was late thirties. I know Slavit and the men was thirty seven or thirty nine, so I shouldn't have said. No, I, I, think, know. I think she but was just in her. I think she was just. My stuff has her in like her late twenties uh, when she won. Okay, like twenty seven. Like I could, I could be wrong, but I, I have her in, in her late twenties. Uh, quite okay, early. but yeah. But um, I'm going to go into a couple of losers. Um, Let's do it. Well, they're not. Okay, so first one: too many similar team kits. Hell yeah. Fine. Let's get out of the Brienne Sans stuff. Talk about the stuff we should have talked about. At the, yeah, let's go. Let's can go. I say, can I say, Eddie, let, let, Eddie, let Eddie do the preamble first. Well, I was going to say, uh, for deviating away from Brienne Sans, I'll just, uh, if, if I'll shout out one more Brienne Sans loser. Okay, very but quick. The, the, this was actually relevant to Brienne okay. Sans because the men's final, even the guy that wasn't from Japanese, from <laughs> Japan, if you weren't noticing, looked like. <laughs> Is from Japan. So sorry, this was actually, I wasn't doing this as a general. This oh, is in okay. Son. When I was watching, I was like, oh, God, I'm, I'm so over this. Like, it's a pretty Japanese haircut, you know, too, man. He spent a lot of time in Japan. There Who you knew? Yep. But anyway, John, I know you want to you wanna run with this, so go, go, go. Well, okay, so here, we're, we'll play a little game here, impromptu game. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to shout out a country, and I want you to give me, uh, I want to, what do you rate their kit? Out of what should we do? Out oh, of five? Shit! I wish I had visuals to go along with this for people at home, but let's do it. Let's just go. Let's do you do want to do out of five or out of ten? Rating, it doesn't rating. matter because I'm probably not going to get over about three for anyone. So okay, well let's do out of five, <laughs> uh, one or even like a zero being just I don't know. You could just wear. Yeah, let's do a five star. Hat. Five star ratings. Five okay, stars. Five star yeah. rating. Yeah. Five is just perfect kit. Yeah. Cannot get any better. Zero is the worst. five. Five is I want one. And then zero stars is zero stars, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So let's start with Team Japan. Two. Ooh, that's see, I I think Japan's uniform isn't too far from where theirs historically has been. It's still roughly the same colorway. I love the new like shield emblem that they have over their heart, where the the outline of the emblem is like a stylized T and a stylized J to make the shield logo. I kind of dig it, and they've always had the dark blue thing going on, so I'm there for it. I, I would give it like a four. It's simple. It's like standard Japanese fare. I'm there for it. Okay. I, I don't know if I'm going to chime in for all these because I feel like I'll just like moderate. But I will say I, in general, I am a, a stickler for I think your national team kit should reflect the colors of your flag. So right there, I would I would give Japan, I don't know, like a zero <laughs> or a one. Well, I that, just... that, that's why I mark Japan as a two, because I feel like... They've been wearing the those colors comp- for decades in climbing. Like, what are, what are we going by? They're racing colors? Like, what what are we... What what are, What well, is the Japanese team colors? Like, white and red, technically? Like, what is it? Yeah, white and red. Yeah, the colors of the flag, right? Is that... Okay, because yeah. I know a lot of countries have, like, different... Like, Australia is obviously, like, green and yellow, right? Like... It, green and gold, gold, yeah, yeah. Yeah, green and gold, okay. pardon me. Okay, So, I just well, don't know what national colors means in that context. Well, but. then, I guess I should... Yeah, forgive me if people are watching and blue is one of Japan's <laughs> national colors. I do, I do not... I'm not aware of that. So, apologies in advance. Please don't pile on with the comments. Um, 
let's go. Please, with... please do. The more comments, the better. Pushes us, pushes us up in the algorithm. Engagement. But I do want to hear. I, I do hope people chime in with uh, their favorite or least favorite kits. Uh, how about the United States? Uh, are we talking the current or when they used to be the department store pink? <laughs> let's do current. The the white the the white kit with the I think it's got the flag on the back, right? I, can't, I I'm stuck at two. There's yeah. There's I, nothing, it, it doesn't it doesn't grab me. I don't know why they there's, made the switch even from their Olymp- like their Olympic kits were some of the most underwhelming. Like clean, we'll say they, their Olympic kits were clean, but their Olympic kits were more distinctive than these current ones. Like I I don't understand why they switched to something so simple. I all of my guesses for why these countries are wearing this stuff is because it's like just the model of apparel that their lead sponsor has around in every possible size, which really sucks for the fact that these are like superstar class, especially team USA. Like, holy shit guys, we can't make shirts for these guys. Are you joking? Anyway. How about team Canada? Team Can? Mm-hmm. I kind of, I, <laughs> I, I have to be impartial at this point. You didn't, you didn't have to comment on that. But that said, when was the last time we saw a Canadian like Jersey in finals, right? We managed to see yeah. Sean wearing his Med- Madison. Yeah. I, the only I'm, one I can think of seeing. I'm glad that they're not just black like they were last season. Um, so I think they're an improvement over last year having the white. Um, but Canada, like, I honestly, I think countries where white and red is their colors, uh, it's it's kind of trouble. It's, it's kind of difficult to make those two colors work in a way that feels serious. Um, it often ends up feeling a little bit like Santa Claus-ish. Um, you know, too much white and it and it, yeah, too much white and it looks like Championship Sunday, kind of what anybody else can do. Too much red and it kind of goes goes the other way. And like, so I think countries like ours, like Austria, like Japan, have a little bit of a, a um, um, what's a, what's the? They have a little bit of struggle with that identity, and it's been the same for like Canadian apparel and sports for a long time. It's like, you know, do we add gold to our uniforms? Do we add black to our uniforms? Which is typically how how Canadian uniforms have uh, have handled that balance. But anyway. Uh, let's do what? Okay, uh, Team France. They have new uniforms. Fucking this year. zero. Uh, see, I <laughs> the French are almost trying not to wear a uniform. If their crop yeah. get any shorter, they're going to be wearing sports bras. No, I'm serious. It, I actually thought there was a rule that you had to cover the torso, and the French are definitely saving some weight in the length of their tops or the females. Um, but yeah, it's kind of is it black or very dark blue and pretty sure it's black but yeah i mean look i'm a kiwi here's the thing black's our color get off (laughs) (laughs) there's Um, a reason our national team is the all blacks yeah maybe 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 france has a different maybe there's a different standard of generic athletic wear in france that they're people but like the french the french outfit is just what every 20 something you know, athletic woman wears on a jog through the city or for a climbing session at a zero character, just because you put a flag on a generic black tank top doesn't mean anything. It's the most disappoint. It is the most disappointing Jersey of the season. A hundred percent. Like, I mean, not that there's jerseys from previous years were extraordinary, but you just said you had typically just like a, a blue uh, Jersey, typical French colors. That's all you need. You're fucking France in climbing. Like just put FRA and giant letters on the back of yeah, a blue Jersey and I'll give it five stars and I'll pay like a hundred bucks for it. And you managed to blow that somehow. So what's don't tell me they're going to wear these jerseys to world championships. Like what the fuck? Anyway, the, to me, the only good jerseys are all the countries that are good at speed. Yeah, well, I, that, I was going to conclude. I was going to say, okay, well, to wrap this up, who who has the best jerseys? The, the, in the best jerseys go to the other actually French country in Europe, Belgium, who are absolutely fucking killing it. Who took that classic French symbol of the the yellow jersey and made it their own. And, uh, and uh, Muriel, Muriel Sarkany, Till I Die, the truest French climber in history, uh, the yellow with the stripes on the sleeves. I got to say that the women's one, like the short sleeve tank one, like doesn't leave me as satisfied. But the men's one is the smartest jersey that I can think of, like going back, going back to the to the 2021 like Bulgarian 
outfit, I guess. That was the the green monster. That was that was of course the highlight. Yeah. But no, the Belgian one is my like top tier. That's six out of five stars for sure. Yeah, and I, I would rate the Indonesian and the Polish as well. Um, They're moving so but, fast, I don't even remember them. I got to look at a picture, man. What the hell? Yeah. Um, well, but just red for the Indonesian and kind of red with a bit of uh, white with a bit of red for the Poles. And it's like they stand out. And I mean, the other classic, of course, is Germany because they do the black top, but then with red pants and that stands out. It's, you know, it's better than <laughs> it's better than the them how they used to wear the green pants. That always perplexed me because I, I well, they, used to, they used to wear they used to wear green tops. Well, they, they, they had their variations, but it was because they were Team Edelrid, man. And that's what made it hilarious. Was I, that's That became so synonymous to me with German climbing was the green and white and orange and black. Yeah, I, I think There's my... so many over the years. Like, sorry, John, I'm just going to yeah, cut you please. off. A few years ago when um, Killian and Anna were the top of the pile and, you know, Sportiva released the men's and women's katana and then the next year the austrian colors were the colors of the men's and women's katana and you're like hmm well sportiva did it first so they definitely played a, a blinder here because they obviously got the austrians to wear basically their, their branded colors so well, but uniforms throughout the ages leave a huge amount to be desired in climbing comps i think well i just googled <laughs> what are the traditional colors of japan and I don't know. Take it with a grain of salt. This this person is it whoever, blue? red, white, black, and blue. So, oh, I that's such a that's such a white and red country cop out. That's like that's we've we've been doing that just as long as Japan has here in Canada for sure. But, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. I don't know. Um, um, uh, I, I have one more. Yeah, <laughs> well, <laughs> we got distracted by two some of the national kits. Um, and, and my other little loser was: Did you guys see the highlights at the beginning of finals? Uh, honestly, I probably fast forwarded through them because I didn't watch finals live, unfortunately. Okay, go back and watch them. Okay, but tie your tie your arms down first so you don't punch the screen. Because if I was to take a non climber and show them that as highlights, they would think that it was a falling comp, not a climbing comp. There were maybe six moves of climbing shown in the whole highlights, but they showed every single person falling off. Um, they did, cut to them on the move they fell. Next person on the move they fell. Next person on the move they fell. It was just five minutes of people falling. Can, and I was like, this is just embarrassing. Can I offer a counterpoint? Were there were there any cool moves on the semifinals climbs? Because it seemed like like slow and steady. Was I, I don't know. I, wa- I watched the highlights first and all I saw was falls. Okay, <laughs> so, yeah, fair enough. Fair yeah, enough. no, I mean... You can make some cool angles, you can do something, but yeah, like maybe you're right, but boy, it was just, it was too much. Showing half a dozen falls across the whole highlights is one thing, but when you're going highlights of men's and women's and it's like 20 falls, it's just like, oh, for goodness sake, you know. Yeah, Yeah, that's a good one. I didn't, I, now that you mention it, I kind of remember thinking that when i was watching it like oh they're just kind of showing the falls uh so that's a good one it's a good one to put well, on the put, list. put it this way I, I write notes as i'm watching and my note is quite literally w2 wtf uh are the climbers are the ifsc highlights before finals the sport is called climbing not falling that Fair was enough. my note because it was just I, I was like please can we just you know i just want to see a sequence You know, even if you're just watching the last four moves of the top five climbers and how they're getting a little bit further and then falling off, at least you're getting narrative. Because when you just show the fall as well, you don't know how high anyone is. Because they're all just close up of someone falling off a hold. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's true. That's true. Instead yeah, of the instead yeah. of the monster close ups this time, how did you guys like the huge like five hundred meter away drone panning shots as somebody's still like climbing? It was uh it was like it was marginally better. I was like, okay, I thought he was looking tired and now I have to like look through binoculars at my screen, but at least I can like technically see his full body. But it was uh yeah, it was a creative choice, slightly better than the hundred X zoom on a foothold that's not being stepped on, but uh yeah. 
Um, it was still better than all the shots of fireworks that Matt didn't know were for Bastille Day. He figured it out eventually, yeah. Yeah, the next day. Yeah. The yeah. next yeah, day, he's enough. like, oh, fair it was enough. Bastille Day yesterday. Yeah. <laughs> I, was, I was just like, oh my goodness, it's like, it was pretty funny, but they need to stop showing when like the crowds go, Oh, I've got a phone and I'm holding up a light. Like that might be entertaining if you're six. I don't mind but, showing it. I do mind making like a big deal out of it, but I don't mind. I don't mind what the MCs do with the crowd. That's all good. Show it if you want to, but I don't, I just don't want it to, I don't want it to be called a light show as if it's something we should stay tuned for. As John and I kind of talked about last week was like, let's, uh, let's not don't, don't hype this stuff up too much, but yeah. I think it's. I think I wrote this in my recap of Brianson. I said I, I think with these light shows, it's kind of like you kind of had to be there. Probably it, it doesn't. I don't think it translates on the live stream to be as visually impressive as I'm sure it is to be there in person and see it. It's probably pretty cool to stand in the crowd and and be part of that. But for us watching it. It's kind of like, eh, I don't know. Like, Get them to spell yeah. something with the lights and I'll be impressed. Then uh, then that would be cool. Make a make a giant mural of, of Marco Maria Scolaris with all of your phones. That's That would be, I'd, I'd give that video a thumbs up right away. Yeah. <laughs> let me, um, let me add a, a loser to the list. And it's kind of in jest, you know, poor Taisei Hama. Two years in a row being the runner up at <laughs> Brienne Song. That yeah. guy just cannot whatever whatever he needs to do to break through from that silver medal spot, he just hasn't cracked the code yet. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh maybe next year. Well, well I'll just wait wait till he wins his first and he'll be the next Serato. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, yeah. Well let's let's talk about John, you, you brought up this idea about like talking about our expectations for the year and how they've gone so far. Cause Taisei is actually kind of a, a good one for that kind of topic. So let's transition a bit and talk a little bit bigger picture for the last, like maybe, I don't know, 20 minutes, however long we want to spend on this. John, do you want to kind of like set up the, the format you kind of suggested? Sure. I just said, Hey, let's all put together. We don't know. We don't know what each of us wrote down. I said, let's just write down this, the single thing that has surprised us, surprised us the most in the season so far, which means, you know, the, the boulder season, the lead season so far, the speed, what, however you want to take it. But what happened was then I was writing mine down and I was able to really quickly riff off like five or six things <laughs> yeah. that have surprised me. So then yeah. I, I think I messaged you guys and I said, oh, never mind just one. Why don't we all just write down a bunch of things that have surprised us and we'll just kind of toss them out and trade back and forth and see see what comes of it so mm. my, my quick write down ended up being 1800 words <laughs> so, uh, for, for just one thing or is that is that a bunch no, of just across slides? across a bunch of things okay yeah um well I'll, i guess i should shall i go first and i can just toss out the Please thing do. can, can yeah. i actually go first to just sure. tie in with oh, yeah, uh, yeah. with oh. where you started which was and, and this is i'm i'm stealing slightly more than one but you mentioned taisei homa i want to mention the 2022 lead World Cup podium of Luca Potichar, Jesse Gruper, and Taisei Homa as being almost irrelevant characters nearly for a lot of the season. Now, of course, that's not fair to say two days after Taisei Homa wins a silver medal. Like, that's a little bit cruel. But those were three big names that we had to assume, like, man, one of these guys has to at least survive into the next season as a big name, maybe taking the title again, staying up there in contention for the World Cup season. Of course, we still have two events, so who knows what's going to happen. But talk about guys that have either fallen off or aren't showing up to enough comps or have just dropped off the radar as the top names in this discipline for this year. Um that was really surprising to me. I thought it was going to be a head to head with these guys, maybe with the spice of getting Jakob back spice of getting Adam back after last year was kind of a final rest year, but to see them just like almost be non-existent in these comps to see them in the commentary booth, like, man, that is, that's really, uh, uh, it was really disappointing for me in 2023. That's a good one. Should we, shall we discuss it or should we just l let it lie and move on to our other oh. surprises? Because I think there's, I yeah. I, I think we can let conversation sort of go organically. And I think with with that one, it, it almost doesn't need discussion. It kind of, you summed it up in the saying. Which yeah. Is, you know, like, 
what, what can we say? Yes, no, yeah, pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> you know? yep. so, yeah, jump jump um, in if you have comments, but otherwise feel free to to, uh, to lead into your own uh, your own topics, yeah. I, I think it kind of leads into mine, but John, do you want to go next or shall I? Yeah, it kind of leads into mine too, which is I have been surprised that Cheon So has not made a lead podium yet in the year 2023. I mean, if you had gone back couple seasons we were thinking that she was just gonna kind of be this consistent podium placer and that hasn't been the case and we've explored this a little bit this season i think some of it might be because of course there are you know crushers in that women's division there's brooke there there's yanya there obviously there's i mori there so it's pretty stacked and also presumably cheon is also training some bouldering with the thought being that she wants to make it to the Olympics again. And so naturally, if you, if you divert the focus from fully to from lead, you know, if you divert the focus a little bit, and so now you're splitting your focus to bouldering and lead, it's maybe expected that results will dip a little bit. And I don't want to make too much of it because she, it's not like she was like way away from the podium. She had a couple that were no. really close there. So, but nonetheless, like I said, it's just been surprising that we haven't seen Cheyenne on a lead podium yet. Serato and Which, Raku fans take note. <laughs> yeah kind of, exactly kind of <laughs> exactly actually let but me throw does... let me throw one more thing in with that real quick is uh but i love her instagram posts and talk about the ultimate narrative buildup for the potential strong performance at world championships this this just feels like just adding pressure to that diamond and creating an awesome story so if if we get a really big successful conference giants uh in uh in burn the setup is is absolutely like make a movie out of it. Come on, give me more of that. Let's go. Yeah, it, it gives it a redemption arc. Yeah. So it's kind of for the protagonist that gets beaten down, beaten down, and comes through. And that's of course is what we're all waiting for. And so that kind of ties into mine, which is I, I'm actually going to read two of mine together. So first part is the number of new winners really brings the potential for a breath of fresh air into the sport. Um, but sadly, there's some issues with how those people are coming into position to be new winners that does detract from that. And then uh, the second part is if the world cup overall isn't dead yet, it's at least on life support. (laughs) Uh, I would love you to expand on the first one because I feel like that is a complex idea. Um, And then we should come back to the second one after we talk about uh, uh, the young athletes coming into the sport. Well, so they actually do tie together because one of the reasons we're getting new winners is that we have depleted fields because the World Cup overall isn't relevant to the climbers anymore. So they're not caring about getting a good season score. All they're caring about is Olympic selection or preparation for the quote-unquote important comps. So they're picking and choosing comps. Now, that could come down to a number of things. It could come down to scheduling. I think in future, the IFSC has to look at this and say, we can't run comps in the six weeks before a world champs, if it's going to be an Olympic selection world champs, because half the climbers aren't there. If you're an organizer, if you ran Brian Thon and you invest all this money and effort in, and then half the athletes don't show, how do you feel? Mm-hmm. Um, I think that's an unhealthy situation to put the organizers into. Um, I think it's unhealthy for the sport to promote and grow. Um, and we're sitting there and we're, we're psyched to see Vita win. We're psyched to see Serato win. We're psyched to see Ariane win. But every single time one of them's winning, we always preface the discussion with, but. And that to me implies that it's broken. And we need to give some level of mana back to the World Cup and the World Cup overall. Whether we make the World Cup five events only and we triple the prize money and make it down to 30th place and we let them wear sponsors gear so that these guys can actually make some money and we make it too attractive for them to pass up. Um, Because at the moment, why are you going to go to, if you're Yanya, why are you going to go to a World Cup? You know, at most, you're going to win and probably cover the cost of your petrol. Um, and if you're 
somewhere down the line and you've just got the chance of squeaking in and you're at the bottom end but looking up it's probably going to cost you money so you're relying on your sponsors you're relying on your gym or your family or your real job in the other world just to get to where you're supposed to be as a professional athlete making money but even if you make money you win and you get like two and a half grand and it's like well okay you know by the time i've driven from slovenia and so say it was Vita's case and say Vita, you know, what did she get for winning Brian Son? Two and a half grand. Mm-hmm. So you think if she was paying to drive from Slovenia, stay in accommodation for four or five nights, eat everything like that, she's, she's getting an average week's pay by winning. Mm-hmm. What happens to, you know, the Chan So who made no money because she came 13th, yeah. but had to fly from Korea, you know, like we are not in a survivable situation as a sport and that is meaning that climbers are choosing picking and choosing their comps too much and it's yeah the whole thing to me is pretty shambolic at the moment and i think a lot of us were scared of olympics when they came in um and we were right but not in the way we expected do you think some of this, though, Eddie, has to do like some of this might um, kind of fix itself once the and hopefully when the Olympics is, and and thus the world championships as the Olympic qualifier and all that are completely separated into three separate disciplines. There's a speed thing, there's a lead thing, and then there's a then there's a, a boulder Olympic qualification pathway, because then. Like you kind of understand now, think about it. If you're a competitor, if you're, if you're Yanya or something and you have the world championships looming where, you know, it all rests on this boulder and lead combined thing. It makes sense why you would want to kind of skip maybe some of these lead centric lead only world cups in the lead up to that, because you're like, Hey, I got to make sure my, my bouldering is, is good here. But it's, if, if it was just lead, like if the Olympic qualification and the world championships all rested on maybe just lead, maybe Yanya just wanted to go for the lead discipline in the Olympics, then it's more conceivable that, oh yeah, okay, well then she would continue to do, she would do Chamonix, she would do Briançon because those are just kind of like tune-ups to the point where you'd be, you'd be insane not to do those because like that's just keeping you fresh for those world championships. So I, I wonder if some of this is just a, the problem of having the disciplines or some of the disciplines in the Olympics and, and by kind of by extension, the world championships in this combined structure. I mean, one of the other things I wrote was I would say splitting speed off from combined has really benefited the athletes, the speed athletes. So yes, exactly. I do a hundred percent agree with you on that, but I don't know how much it'll rectify itself when you have tiered competitions of different value. I think as a sport, we need to look at raising World Cups back up to a high value event for the athletes. I I do really feel that, and I don't know whether it's Olympics or COVID or what has detracted from the World Cups, but I feel that, you know, the World Cup overall used to be a huge deal. Yes. Now, I mean, the World Cup overall is whoever's still there at the finish. Yeah. You know what? So, the one of those moments that really messed me up was 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 it twenty twenty one when Ianya won the overall lead uh, with her win in Kron from only attending three events, which was extraordinary. She didn't know that she had won the overall lead. Like in what generate? Like I, I Yanya admittedly had more crazy events in the year twenty twenty one than any climber in history has ever had to deal with, probably. But can you, man, athletes athletes knew exactly what place they had to come in that final comp of the year to win that World Cup overall uh, for, for like decades. That was the prize. Yeah. Let me let me just go off Eddie's thing. First of all, yeah, we don't know how, how the disciplines being split off and separated is going to affect the Olympic calendar. Although if, if we're 
looking at the schedule that we're seeing for next year where the top 48 ranked climbers are going to be in a four event long series of the OQS for the start of 2024 and then the Olympics is in August what season do we have left for a World Cup and if there is one what athletes are going to be there if the top 48 boulder and lead climbers are going to be at this OQS thing if that's the future we have to look forward to where every four years we lose effectively an entire season then that's I you know we'll see how it goes but to me that's too much of a, of a shift kind of going off eddie's point just because i like talking about formats and, and championship structures um i'm i'm 100 percent there with eddie in terms of the uh in terms of uh uh uniforms and and sponsorship potential but get you know what get me to the point where the world championships isn't about being inclusive anymore and the world cups is what qualifies you to the world championship and you get world cup points for how you do at the world championship make it a a year long story when i say year long i mean season long pardon me make it a season long storyline that ends in the world championships make it all relevant to each other you got to do well in the world cups to get to the world championship they're all part of the same system it all builds to the final event rather than it being a separate event that is the exact same format and worth the exact same amount of money but every four years it's like especially important like yeah i we you know and again we're offering very like surface level suggestions there's a lot more complexity to it um particularly because we're supposed to be an olympic nation or an olympic uh, sport and so that changes the type of expectations that we unfortunately have to have for how we create events and how our qualifying structures are built but um, I'm I'm with you completely having the World Cups the World Cup season win being the overall prize in history just having that being diminished to almost nothing is is uh, a really sad change in my opinion for the sport for sure and, and you know comp climbing and especially at the World Cup level I wouldn't classify it as a star-driven sport yet, right? It's it's not, really. I mean, there are stars. I don't mean that. But, I mean, like, you look at Brianson, look at the size of that crowd, and and yet there were no – there was no Yanya. There was no <laughs> – right? Like, they still showed up in mass for that, which was really we, cool. That's, so that's a, but, that's a very fair point really quickly. We never know who's going to be in finals. It could be all the stars. It could be none of them. That's, like, that's a fair point. Right. Now, but, does, and, does it affect viewership? The day of the final stream, you know, I honestly haven't analyzed it. Maybe somebody should look at viewers compared to who is in attendance. But uh, but yeah, you don't know who's going to be in finals. Yeah, people still watch. And I can I can see as climbing continues to be it's kind of continues in this Olympic era and we have multiple Olympics for comp climbing, then it could become a star driven sport because the Olympics will create the stars right over time. And then it gets kind of funky because you can imagine then places like a Briançon, which is a little kind of unique because there's such a climbing heritage, you know, in France and everything. But you can see like a place like that having trouble then garnering garnering big crowds because people won't want to come if there aren't these big stars that have been established through the Olympics. And you see this in other sports too. I'm thinking of uh, like, for example like tennis, a lot of times after somebody wins something like Wimbledon, then they won't want to go to like the small little, uh, smaller tournament that happens a couple weeks later or whatever. And those event organizers are really bummed because they're like, oh, we want the guy that just won Wimbledon to come here because that's what the crowd wants to come see. So it does have an effect on the the att attendance of these comps. And again, I don't think this happens until this is more of a star-driven sport, but it will be more of a star-driven sport at as it continues to be in the Olympics. And I think then you might see some of these people like Brian, these event organizers pushing back to the IFSC and see, saying like, hey, if we're gonna go trouble to the trouble to organize this comp, we wanna get some of the stars here. Like we wanna sort of, you know, we want this to be a big draw for all the people around Europe to come to this. And it's, it, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. You would almost want to contract, have a strength fulfilled clause in your contract that if you're holding a World Cup, the expectation is that you have at least half of the top 10 or whatever in attendance. Um, because if you're investing hundreds of thousands of dollars into holding a World Cup and look, the female finals in Brionson was one of my favorites in a long time because you actually didn't know who was going to win and that was fantastic. But... 
from a marketability perspective, if you were a sponsor of the event, do you get the same draw? As Tyler was saying, what are the viewing figures? What you know, we know the domestic audience is huge because they've had comps there since the late eighties. You know, they've had uh Serge Chevalier or however you pronounce yeah. it, was just yeah. up the valley and then came down into Brian Son. But I I think we have a poverty mentality as a sport and we need to get over it because I honestly think if you put dollars in front of athletes, more athletes will show up. Um, and so I know, obviously, I've said this a few times and people are like, oh, shut up about disc golf. But I'm, I play disc golf on the side. So disc golf world champs are coming up uh, end of August, start of September. Do you know what the minimum prize pool is? And this is two divisions, you know, men's and women's, so it'll be split. But this is the overall prize pool at the moment. Minimum is two hundred and seventy-five thousand US. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and I tell you what, not many disc golfers who are eligible will be missing that comp. What? Uh, so, what do you think the the prize for first place is going to be compared to the couple thousand euros for the climbing world championship? Uh, so your average disc golf pro tour, which is probably smaller viewership than climbing and smaller thing than climbing your average prize pool for and you know there's one of these every week in the states is 80 to 100 and something thousand prize pool which pays down to 40th place and the winner normally gets about 10 grand so i would assume for world champs the winner will take home 30 35 grand right okay so solidly in like five digits of, uh, oh of yeah, Euros, yeah, where we are in the the low four digits for the winners yeah. in Euros. I, we, yeah. We've gone down by like a thousand euros since COVID, <laughs> because we decided it was better to give lunch money to the people that came eighth. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think we, as a sport, we need to be getting people involved who can get more sponsors on board to pay. And I think I think if you're in semis, you should be getting paid. I think we we should have a system where if you made the broadcast, you made the money. Uh, even if it's just your entry fee back. And that's the other thing. Our entry fees are too low. Push up our entry fees. All right. Before, you know, before we get let this be a laundry list of, of, <laughs> of Eddie's gripes about the economics of climbing, let me, let me push it back to us talking about surprises from the season. <laughs> Because I think this is an excellent topic, and what we should do is we should do this episode, but like actually come at it prepared. Because it's my favorite thing yeah. to talk about. But let's wrap up this. Let's wrap up this show with some some last chatter about surprises uh, for this season. Um, so uh, I I talked about the 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 uh, uh, the men's lead field. Eddie added on about um, the the uh, the shrinking importance of the World Cup. Um, John, your surprise was. Shay, sorry, I'm I'm already in the world of sponsorship money now that Eddie's put me in that hub space. <laughs> che and So hasn't made a lead podium yeah, yet. Yeah, Che and So hasn't made a lead podium yet. Right, sorry. Um I didn't write down any of my surprises, but uh let me just come up with one off the very top of my head really quick. Let's figure this out. I Mori being absolutely absent effectively from this season. That's going to be my other one. Not necessarily in her performances. Her performances are pretty good, if not really good. That's awesome. But coming out of the end of last season again, we really wanted to see a lot more. And it looks like we're just going to see uh, Sierra at World Championships, hopefully at one or two of the lead World Cups after that. Um, but very disappointing considering that looked like the story of 2023 um, at the end of last year. And of course, uh, complete blue balls on that front, which is, uh, is really too bad. That could have been a banger of a fight. That seems to be the Aymari Wade. She, you know, she is... <laughs> Just the drop some breadcrumbs and then ditch yeah, for three yeah. years. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, she she, yeah. she just comes in cameos hard and then yeah. like disappears back to study. It's there it's go. really fascinating because she really does leave the audience wanting. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I would say that on the one hand, I don't understand the logic of her only doing one lead event so far this year. I think Innsbruck was her only was her only event for lead. I would say that, and yet she's proven before that she's got a handle on this formula, 
And so it seems to work for her. I would question a little bit. Uh, I look, I know she's going to school and that, and that's and good for her. I, I think we were just talking though about like star, like building star power and, and all of that. Like if you would, I, I don't know if she has an agent, but I would imagine if any agent talking to her would be like, look, you, you know, you're, the best in the world one of the best in the world you should be out there building your brand so to speak and am i right like in saying she doesn't even have an instagram account though like i think i'm right isn't there like a an i mori fan account which is like the only account that is actually sharing stuff from her but anyway yeah i doubt she has a manager if she doesn't have an instagram account but yeah and so i does. i guess from like a star building perspective she I, she's not doing herself any favors except there is that, like we were saying, like you were saying, that like mysterious element, that enigma element, where she just kind of shows up and rocks and rolls and then leaves. Uh, you know, I guess that works. I, I don't know. I don't know if she builds more fans that way than she would the traditional method. And and it, not to say she like wants to build fans. She probably just wants to climb and study. But uh, it'd be an interesting conversation if you if you were her her agent or her manager, like what, like if, or if you could be a fly on the wall and like, listen to these conversations because uh, you wonder if they think about this sort of thing. It is the kind of thing where I just have to assume that there are more variables than just her climbing career, which I think we knew from last season already to an extent, like just different elements of her life are, are taking up time or taking up space. And, and that's totally cool. And again, my complaints, and I think all of our complaints on this kind of topic are just, we, we love the sport. We want to see more narratives. We want to see all the best climbers at every comp. And of course, a lot of climbers can't give us that for, for lots of different, very good reasons. But yeah, still, still disappointing for me. I mean, to me, it's almost like, and I know she's even more so in this case, but she's almost like the Japanese Ola Murislow. Because yeah. Ola picks and chooses her comp, and you guys will be sitting there going, she's going for the season sweep, she's going for it, she's not entered. I'm I'm Charlie Brown getting absolutely lucid for the last two seasons of like it's gonna happen this year it's gonna happen this year let me kick the ball and then it just and, gets... and the answer yeah. is Ola almost retired from comps about seven years ago because she was burnt out she couldn't maintain mm. and she stepped back and she was going to retire and then she came back and did just a couple mm -hmm. and went okay this is a manageable level I can focus my training this is what I can do. And ever since then, with her husband, who's also a coach, they've been really sensible about cycling up her training for the right events. And, you know, she has no interest in, at this stage at least, in winning the overall. And so she just goes and wins comps and then goes back and mm. trains. And she's made a good living of it. But she, again, has become the enig enigmatic figure because of it. Let me wade into the water here a little bit because I have a surprise, something that has surprised me this season that pertains to Alexander Miroslaw. I'm a little surprised that no one in the women's division has gotten a little closer to Alexandra's world record of 6.25. I think I think Alexandra ran a, like a, if I remember, like a 6.3 and then she bettered it and ran a 6.2, 6.25. We've seen... And I don't, I don't have a list of all the times, all the fastest times so far this season at events. But I know that like Alexandra I, and I Natalia do. Kaluchka have run some six sixes. Uh, I think Natalia Kaluchka. Yeah. So had since a... since Alexandra's last record break at Seoul, uh, when she ran six two five, all we have seen is a six three six, six three nine, six four five, and six seven two. So nobody's come within within a tenth of a second of her time since she broke that, since she reset that record at 6.25. It's yeah. only gotten to me, worse. To me, fact. I'm Each actually the opposite surprise. I'm actually the opposite surprise of how close, because for a long time, until Aries came, it was really just like, um, it was Ola and... Russian or Yulia, Yulia and Annex, Yulia like time 7.32, and Anik. right? And there was like only a couple of people even in the conversation. And that's incredibly slow compared to where we are now, but there's only a couple. And then at the start of the season, when Ola came out and ran, ran those times, I was like, no one's going to be within half a second of her. I legitimately thought that's so much faster than the previous record. No one's even going to get close. And now we have so many athletes capable of running sub seven. I'm, 
I'm actually shocked. I'm like, wow, that's like, you know, back in the, you know, it was only 2019, the last comp that someone ran sub seven for the first time ever. One of the best big final races that I've ever watched. Absolutely. Yeah. The Ari Sasanti, uh, Sasanti Raheyu. Six nine. It was pretty. Five. It was yeah. pretty emotional. That was a stunner, man. I was taking photos of it and it didn't even register. I was just like, "Oh, that's not bad." <laughs> <laughs> and, and then, like, it took a while to get through my brain. And I went, "Oh, wait, that's six nine nine five, not seven nine nine. You know, like I literally didn't click yeah. the first digit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me put you guys on the spot here. A yes or no? Do you think we see a new world record set at World Championships? Ooh. This is where I feel like not technically knowledgeable enough to understand the dynamics of a speed wall. But in the same way, you know what? The like Alexander Miroslaw in a new tri- like in a new peak time, like the ultimate peak of the season. You know, I'm not gonna put it past her. Fuck it. Yeah. Let's let's do another record. Let's take it down to six one five. I don't give a crap. Like let's go. Let's take it into the fives. Whatever. I love I it. Say, there's so <laughs> many variables as as Tyler just yeah, it's going to be so many variables. If it's a slippery wall, if it's a, I, it's going to be the first indoor speed roll cup cold, of the year. The like I don't, is too hot. Yeah, I got like, no idea, man. I mean, you know, you got to remember in Hachioji, you know, like when Ludo won, it was a, I think it was like slower than half the girls. Yeah, possibly. You, like you this... never know. You never know what it's going to be on the day because it all comes down to slips and. And they're not trying to be their fastest at the world champs. They're just trying to beat the other person. Yeah. Um, Winning, getting to the top two is, this is going to be the most important, probably, this is, yeah, maybe since the speed route debuted, this is like the most important speed. Yeah, well, the top the top two get Olympic ever. picks. Top two, so, yeah. so you don't want to false start. You don't want to do that. If you've got something which has got a 15% success rate, but it's going to make you two temps faster, Mm-hmm. You're not going to do it this comp yeah. because you want the... So I can't see a new speed world record. But what I'd love to see is after the comp, if they just had a an open session. Yeah. You know, have the comp and then say, okay, here's 10 grand for any girl that gets under six. Mm-hmm. Well, well, it is in Watch the record get so... broken in practice, man. Like, <laughs> Well, and that's what I mean because in yeah. practice when there's no pressure. Mm-hmm. So it'd be great to do that, like... No false start issues, no nothing. Just here's ten grand. Everyone gets five runs. If you was, get under six seconds, you get ten grand. You know. I was, I was gonna say, give that ten grand to like the the groundskeeper who manages the facility since it's <laughs> indoors, and say, here's ten grand. Set the temperature for this. Set the humidity for this. Just get everything like fine tuned so perfectly. And then yeah. just have the have the kind of the free for all, like you said, Eddie. Uh, yeah. Um, should I let me toss out just some other surprises? I know we're kind of going long. No, no, yeah, go let's, for it. We all we always go long, so go. For keep it. keep going. Keep them. Let's keep them like briefish. But yeah, let's let's do a few more. I'll give I'll give three. Um, kind of uh, this one, Tyler. You and I have talked about this, and we said it's it's all kind of nullified depending on what happens at the World Championships, but. I am surprised, I have to, like a broken record at this point, that the American men haven't really provided anything of note this season, kind of in boulder or lead, really. It's uh, Sean Bailey had that fourth place finish at Salt Lake City, and I, you know Sam Watson's had a great season in speed, but other than those two, I, it's just been kind of shocking to really not have the american men be a talking point at all see you've had you've had two good seasons and already you forget what it's like to be an american climbing fan from the 2010s eh? you're just like it's it's the complete whiplash of going back to how it used to be yeah that's a fair surprise yeah um two more quickly i'm surprised just a small one but i'm surprised it did not take yanya more comps to find her elite form Remember, she, I mean, it's like we forget that she was injured for so much of this season. She comes back right away. She got a second place. Flip of the coin, basically. I mean, all credit to Orion, who beat her. But it was really, really close. It was almost a first place for Yanya. Uh, but she gets that second place. And then just like that, she's she's back. She's the Yanya that everybody remembers. I, I'm, I do not think that every competitor 
or maybe any other competitor could could do that. That was a really incredible feat. So that surprised me. Lastly, going back to the Americans, I'm surprised that Brooke Rabatou had basically as good of a boulder season as Natalia Grossman. I don't know if anybody saw that coming, really. We certainly knew Brooke was a crusher in lead, uh, and we knew Natalia was a crusher in bouldering, and Brooke and Natalia both ended up having great boulder seasons. It was it, This was really a it was really a phenomenal season for for both of them in the Boulder discipline. And I'm I'm on board with like the results being a surprise, but like you know once once you acknowledge like the circumstances, like Yanni being out for the first half and Natalia having this like terrible health condition and having some of the worst performances we've seen from her in a couple of years, then like not so much, but but yeah. certainly like a a a, a solid uh, a solid start, a very a very Vita Lucan esque gold medal, you might say. Yeah, I mean, Vita's another one, obviously. Yeah, John's mad about that. John, John, John wants to push back on that one. <laughs> I don't know about that, but I don't know who. I don't know where I push back. Am I pushing back for for Brooke and Natalia, or am I pushing back for Vita? There, I don't know, but <laughs> or all three. Yeah, we're um, all three. I, I'm going to go on with one that is related to that. I, I'm just surprised how many of the females are broken or sick this year. Um. It's been a lot of injuries, a lot. And I don't know if anyone saw my Instagram where I linked up that medical study and they said previous or compared to previous medical studies where it used to mostly be finger injuries. Now it's shoulders and knees and ankles and it's the movement joints that from probably from the movement style of climbing are failing but also the level of sickness has gone up as well you know hannah's been sick natalia's been sick any given world cup i open my instagram and some of the girls are and and they're not sick as in the flu they're sick as in health issues sick Mm -hmm. which is you know i we can all speculate what's going on there but we need to be protecting our athletes it's really disappointing to see fields where people are like turning up going i couldn't you know i was vomiting all night or i was whatever and you're like how what what what's going on this didn't used to happen so or or not as publicly maybe it's just a thing of social media sharing that we but you know i remember akio the classic example glorious long career never missed a comp for injury Mm mm-hmm you know, I mean, Yanya's injury, that was a out-of-season injury, but from hearing what Roman said, was quite a bad toe injury. They were pretty scared. Um, beat his knee, absolutely mashed. You know, had to take out half a meniscus. Like, there, there's... I'm surprised at how beaten up they are going on the run into world champs because I would have thought the coaches and it's probably why they're pulling them out of comps. I would have thought the coaches would have been putting them in cotton wool. Yeah. I was going to say that this does not help our, our argument of wanting the, like the, all the competitors to do more world cups, because the fact is they're, if they're getting injured more, which it seems to be, uh, that would indicate they should probably do less world cups which means well as i them... said even even if there were less world cups but they all showed up would be better than if there's more world cups and they don't just ban yeah. ban any athletes from competing in more than one discipline that's that would make me that would also be yep yeah. yeah you sign up at the <laughs> sign up at the beginning of the year and write down what discipline you're doing yeah yeah that would be pretty funny Everybody just standing in the lobby with their form waiting for Yanya to show up and declare which discipline she's in. Then everybody switched well, to... <laughs> I was going to say, it has got to be secret ballot so you don't know yeah. what the other people are putting in. Yeah, Otherwise, yeah. Yanya put down bouldering and every other yeah. single girl puts down lead. Yeah, 100%. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, you guys got any more surprises or any final thoughts before World Championships? I, I, I have a thought, not a surprise, sure. uh, that I just want to read out. Uh, and this one, I'm going to read out because I actually wrote it and I want to probably just say it as I read it, wrote it, is lastly and controversially, I'm sure, the sport is really missing the Russians. We know why they aren't here and I respect and stand with that over all else. But I would argue that no federation except the Japanese has developed the sport domestically as well over the last decade. And it's tragic that because of the actions of their government, we can't leverage that expertise and have them back in the field. And yeah, so that 
was just as as I wrote it. And, you know, I understand why they're not there. I support them not being there, but God, I missed them. I, uh, I will be expressing the same sentiment with slightly different rationale, but same sentiment in a video uh, two weeks from now, right before the World Championships. Um, yeah, I feel a lot of the same stuff, 100%. Um, yeah. Anybody else? I'll, I'll save comments then for when the video drops. So you know, tease them with the, there tease them with the video. Yeah. <laughs> All right, guys. The countdown is on. The Burn World Championship starts August 1st. You got two straight weeks of the best boulderers, lead climbers, and speed climbers. It's going to be the most and maybe only stacked competition of the entire year. So make sure you're watching. And, of course, we're going to try and wrangle some more guests to have a breakdown, hopefully from the first week and then a separate one for the second week because there's just going to be so much climbing to watch. It's going to be hard to keep track of, but it's going to be the best climbing of the season, fingers crossed. So, uh, as always, thanks to John for joining me and Eddie Falk uh, making his his usual two, two or three uh, uh, appearances a season. All Always great to have you. Of course, if you watched, and especially if you watched this far, thank you so much. Join the Discord so we can chat with you during these competitions. We love Talk and Shop. You can support this podcast on Patreon. Uh, uh, you can subscribe, of course, to the channel. I'm not sure if that does anything algorithmically anymore, but number go up makes me feel good uh, inside. And then, of course, you can like and drive the engagement by commenting whether it's vitriol or just ooey gooey gushing over how good this uh, how good this show was, uh, do whatever you want. Just give us those uh, give us those clickety clacks. All right. Thanks so much for yeah. And go ahead. Who has the best? Who has the best team kit? Get in. Yeah. We want to see who 100%. has the best team kit. Is it Tyler, John, or me? No, I'll be athletes with me. We got to do. You know what we should do? We should do. A, we should do a haircuts through the ages. Because uh, me and John have had a few different do's across the episode of this. And, of course, Eddie, you've had a couple as well. COVID in particular. Mates. Yeah, 100%. You had you had some solid hair then, buddy. So, yeah, we'll, we'll, when we have, whenever there's a really boring comp, we'll get you back on and we'll do a, we'll do a best, hair, uh, best hair competition. All right. That's it from us and from Beyonce on. Talk to you in a couple weeks in the next episode of The Debrief.